So in this video we'll be covering chapter 7, section 1, which is chemical names and formulas. And the reason we need uh, names and formulas for various chemicals is because our common names for many uh, chemicals, such as water or, you know, salt, while they help us, you know, communicate what objects we need or share or what have you, they don't give very much uh, information about the actual makeups or properties of these uh, everyday objects. So what chemists do is they systematically create names and formulas for various compounds so that they can better understand their makeups. So for example, water, as many of you I'm sure know, has a chemical formula H2O, or salt, as I've covered in previous videos, has the formula NaCl. Now these formulas are pretty straightforward for molecular compounds like water uh, because the formula simply lists the number of atoms in each molecule. So if we were to take octane, which is the main fuel you burn when you start up your car and start burning gasoline, you'll note by the subs by first of all the symbols that it contains carbon and hydrogen and then if you look at the subscripts you'll note it contains 8 carbon and 18 hydrogen and they lay out the formula in this way so that it makes it easy to understand the chemical makeup of a molecule. However for ionic compounds you can't just list the number of atoms that are interconnected because if you'll remember they're all sort of connected in a lattice that forms a crystalline solid. So what they do is chemists will use the formula unit that is the simplest balanced ratio of the cation and the anion once you balance with the charge. So I'll give you an example. If we were to take aluminum sulfate which contains an aluminum cation and a sulfate which is a polyatomic ion uh, anion. What you do when you balance out the charges, you find that the neutral formula unit that has the least number of atoms ends up with two aluminum and three sulfate uh, ions. And you'll note these parentheses on the outside of the sulfate ion with the three on the outside of the parentheses, and that is because if you were to go in and look at one formula unit of aluminum sulfate, you would have to distribute this three in so there would actually be two aluminum, uh, three sulfur, and twelve oxygen atoms within one formula unit of aluminum sulfate. But they put the parentheses and distribute this three out in order to clarify that the sulfate acts as one anion collectively. So just as we discussed polyatomic ions in the previous chapter, now we're going to be discussing monatomic ions. And monatomic ions are ions made from one atom. So they're an atom that has either gained or lost electrons to become either positively or negatively charged. And this happens because atoms, in general, want to have this stable noble gas formation over here. So what elements in say groups one or two will do is they will lose an electron so that they can have a stable gas formation of the previous energy level. So let's say lithium will lose one electron and then it will become lithium plus because it now has three protons and two electrons but it has the stable noble gas formation of helium and beryllium will do the same thing but it'll lose two electrons to become beryllium 2 plus again so that it can get over here and become this stable gas formation and the same thing is true on the opposite side of the table in groups uh, 15, 16, 17, etc except they gain electrons to get a full noble gas notation within their current energy level so nitrogen for example will gain three electrons to become and three minus. And for the most part it's very simple to uh, figure out how, which monatomic ion a element will form once it gains or loses the appropriate number of electrons. For instance lithium over here is only one element away backwards from getting to the stable helium formation so it will lose that one electron 
or nitrogen over here needs three extra electrons to come over here and become a uh, noble gas, have a noble gas stable octet in its uh, valence. So it will naturally gain the three electrons to form again that N3 minus. So you can see that for the most part the main group elements will either gain or lose electrons in the easiest way possible in order to form this stable octet, uh, but will become ionized and charged in the process. Now this rule isn't absolutely true. For example, uh, if you look at group 14, it's very difficult because they have four, they're sort of stuck in between the two options of gaining or losing electrons. And this makes uh, elements like carbon very versatile for sharing electrons. However, it's very difficult to ionize them. And once you get away from the main group, when you get in here with the D block, uh, it's not so simple. Many of these will lose uh, different numbers of electrons depending on the situation to become various ions. Uh, iron, for example, can gain either, or sorry, lose either two or three electrons to become uh, an Fe2 plus cation, or it can also be an Fe3 plus cation. So in here it gets a bit ambiguous with many of the elements as to like a certain ion they become. Now just like there's a simple system for realizing uh, how each element ionizes, there's also a very simple system for naming them. So for example, the cations over here just keep their name when they become ionized. So a lithium plus ion is just referred to as lithium when it's in a compound. However, when you get over here to the anions over on the right side of the table, it gets a bit more tricky. What you do is you take off the end of the name of the element and replace it with the suffix "-ide". So for example, this nitrogen anion would be called nitride. Or an element, or a compound rather, that contained uh, oxygen that was ionized, so it was O2 minus, would have the suffix uh, oxide, etc. Now, when you get into the ambiguous cases within the D block, such as iron, which has two oxidation states, uh, what you simply do is you write out, because they're still cations, you can simply write out the name. So you would write out iron. However, you have to specify which ion it's forming. So you put the Roman numeral of its charge in here. So if you were to write the Fe2 plus ion within the name of a compound, you would write iron with a little Roman 2 in there. Or if you were to do the other, in this, in this case uh, an iron 3 cation, you would just write iron and then with a 3 within the parentheses.